If you're in a small group, you know we've been studying the book of Revelation, and uh, we currently, at least our group, has looked at chapter 12 and 13. Uh, next week, it's chapters 14 through 16. If you're wondering where you are or wherever you are is probably just fine. Our scripture this morning comes out of that scripture we've been looking at, chapter 12, and I'm going to start with verse 7 through 12. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. The dragon there is Satan. But he was defeated, amen, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O, o heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. I'm going to pick up the last verse in that chapter, verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand and the sea. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning. Lord, we ask that you would uh, help us to discover how you'd have us live. Lord, uh, we pray also that you would uh, enlarge our minds, that we can understand your plan fully. And Lord, that you would help us for those opportunities to share with others. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, Revelation 12, it's a summary passage. It's fit right in between what has been seven trumpets of God's wrath being poured out on the earth during this uh, tribulation time that it's describing. And uh, it's a passage that takes the reader through the history uh, of the animosity between Satan and God's people. When studying the book of Revelation, it helps to realize that out of 404 verses in that book, 280 of them are basically quotes out of the Old Testament. Therefore, having a good command of the Old Testament makes understanding the Revelation much easier. It's not about deciphering the mark of the beast. It's not written to help us figure out who the false prophet or the Antichrist is. It's written to give us hope and to bring us back constantly to the fact that life is short and we'll be in heaven soon. So put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In our scripture this morning, it's an adaptation of the woman in Revelation 12, the very first verse. First appears back in Genesis 37. It's one of Joseph's dreams that he had that he shared with his mom and dad and his 11 brothers. Uh, this is one of many places in Genesis where Joseph serves as a type of the Messiah. In Revelation 12, 2, the woman is personified as Mary, the Lord's mother. And put the two together and you realize that the woman represents the nation of Israel who gave birth to the existing Messiah. Beginning in verse 3, we see Satan's fall, in which he 
was joined by a third of the angelic host, now Satan's demonic horde, describing Satan's attempt to prevent Jesus the Messiah from fulfilling his role as redeemer, having by, uh, been the real leader behind the plot uh, to have Jesus killed. Remember, God is in control. He controls all this. Jesus went to the cross willingly, even in fact for the joy set before him, knowing that he would redeem uh, you and me and the people who put their faith and trust in God. He was caught off guard, him, Satan, thinking, I got him, I'm going to kill him. He was caught off guard by the resurrection, which turned what he thought would be his greatest victory into a resounding defeat. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 2.11, For we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We're at war, not only with our flesh, the sin that works within us, but there's also the assault from Satan and his demonic horde, influence individuals and nations as well. Our only hope is Jesus Christ. John 10.10 10, in reference to the schemes of the devil says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to rob and to destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and might have it more abundantly. Talk about satanic influences on a nation. Pelosi's COVID-19 relief bill that has been passed now by the Democratic controlled House and the Senate is not a single uh, bill just for COVID. It's 592 pages. Not a single Republican voted for the bill. The $1.9 trillion American rescue plan is anything but a rescue plan. $400 billion of that is set aside to cover elective abortions. $50 million of that is to fund Planned Parenthood, which violently ends the lives of more than 354,000 unborn children a year. If Black Lives Matter movement wants to make a different and greater impact, they should shut down Planned Parenthood, who kills thousands of African-American babies each year. Oh yes, Satan's influence is very involved with nations around the world. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12 tells us, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the principalities, against the spiritual powers over this present darkness. The book of Revelation reveals the final victory Jesus gives us over sin, death, Satan, and those demonic powers. Far too many believers are ignorant of who our foe is and the way he works. The, jo the apostle John gives us a look into the, this enemy and his final demise. Past history. Before our enemy was called the devil, his name was Lucifer, the ultimate embodiment of evil on earth. <clears throat> Wanting to be greater than God, he developed an eye problem, that is, an inflated ego. Isaiah 14, 13 says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of congregation. In the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. According to the book of Ezekiel, which describes Lucifer as the power behind the king of Tyre, Lucifer was not only a worship leader in heaven, but he was unparalleled in beauty and uniquely anointed. Charismatic character, uh, quite different than Hollywood often shows us. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15 says, Thus says the Lord God, 
you were an example of perfection, full of wisdom and beautiful. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, rubies and diamonds, the jasper, sapphire, the emerald, and ornaments of gold. Beautiful tambourines and flutes were made for you the day you were created. You were perfect in thy ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you and you began to do evil. Lucifer must have been a good musician having tambourines in his hands and a pipe organ for a voice. And there he was, year after year, decade after decade, millennia after millennia, leading heavenly worship until the day he began to wonder why all the praise was going to someone else. The created wanted to be greater than the creator. Those who serve the Lord must keep this in mind, for that same tendency can creep in any time we think, well, here am I doing this, but no one seems to appreciate what I'm doing. No one acknowledges what I've done. Be careful. That's the iniquity of Lucifer's fall. Lucifer was cast out of heaven and became Satan or our adversary, the devil, the accuser. And to this day, like fingerprints on a blackboard, praise and worship drive him crazy because they remind him of what he once was but never will be again. There's a great little book in fact, it's free online. It's only 160 pages that C.S. Lewis wrote, uh, Screw Tape Letters, that gives us insight, uh, insightful descriptions of how Satan influences and deceives individuals. As Wormwood talks to Screw Tape, and they have this conversation how to deceive believers. Second Chronicles chapter 20. There's an account of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Uh, they were surrounded by the Edomites, the Ammonites, and the Moabites, the Mites, Knights, and Bites. <laughs> After the Spirit of the Lord came upon a man named Jehaziel, he stood up and told Jehoshaphat, Do not fear. The battle is not yours, but the Lord's. And there'll be no need to fight. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. So instead of sending soldiers out, Jehoshaphat sent out the choir into battle and they began to sing praises. The Ammonites, Moabites, and Edomites became so confused that they began to fight among themselves, leaving the Israelites victorious, a victory that God had given them. Perhaps maybe you felt surrounded by depression, maybe discouragement, maybe defeat. That would be a good time to give thanks and to praise the Lord. There is power in praise. Future hostility. Following the loss of his position in heaven. By the way, when Satan was thrown out of heaven, Job gives us a clear picture. Still, he had access to go back into heaven as the accuser. <laughs> Satan is spew his anger out upon God's people on earth. Satan continues his campaign against the church as he accuses the brethren day and night, as I read in verse 10 of Revelation 12. But after the church is raptured, he loses access to heaven during the tribulation. And when the church is removed, he can then ramp up his demonic influences, deceiving nations into worshiping himself where he'll go into the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem and declare himself to be God. The second half of the tribulation begins, called the Great Tribulation, and it'll last for three and a half more years, culminating in Christ's return, overthrowing Satan and putting him into prison for a thousand years, that millennial reign with Jesus on the throne. Present strategy. The name, the devil, that's the Greek word, meaning to slander or to falsely accuse, is a malignant liar 
the name Satan is especially used in Job and in the New Testament Gospels. However, his accusations against believers are unsuccessful because Christ is our advocate. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. But the devil can be overthrown on earth the same way he is overthrown in heaven, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of testimony. I belong to the Lord, having believed on Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, repenting of my sin and receiving his forgiveness and a new life in Christ. That's my testimony, the blood of the lamb. When the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, it was the blood applied to the door, was applied in the shape of cross on the side posts and top. <clears throat> they were spared the death of the firstborn when the death angel flew over Egypt if they, if they had applied the blood. So too, God will bless your home, your marriage, your family, not on the basis of how much you've prayed or how good you've been, but on your understanding of the potency and sufficiency of the blood of Calvary. God's blessings don't come just when everything is going great. Thank God when they are going great. But he can bless us even in the darkest valleys. Romans 8, 28. All things can work together for good for those who put their trust in God and are called according to his purpose. If anyone sins, thank you, we have an advocate, a defense lawyer in the person of Jesus Christ. Satan is the prosecuting attorney accusing and condemning us endlessly. And what would our defense attorney have us do? He would have us agree with our adversary. <laughs> a truly brilliant strategy you're right, I'm a sinner. I've been washed by the blood of the lamb and my filthy rags have been exchanged for the righteousness of Christ, past, present, and future. When Satan condemns you, don't fight him. Don't say, I didn't really mean it. Or, I'm not really that bad compared to others. Or I can't help it. Say, you're right. In fact, I'm a lot worse than you even know because since you're not omniscient, Satan, you can't see the deceitful and desperately wicked state of my heart. But the blood of my defense attorney has cleansed me of my past sins. I'm forgiven. Therefore, it's not about anything I do or I don't do. It's about what Jesus has done on my behalf. It's about the blood the word of our testimony. What is my testimony? I shared it briefly in one sentence earlier. What has the Lord done for me? As he did with David, he rescues me from the horrible pit. He brought me out of the miry clay and set my feet on the rock, the solid rock, is Jesus. Every cult, every false religious system has a man or a woman reaching up to God, wanting to be or like or take the place of, whether it be through knocking on doors or selling watchtower magazines or being baptized in holy underwear, all religious say, I can make it to heaven's gate on my own, by my own efforts. I like that underwear thing too. <laughs> the accuser of the brethren the accuser of the brethren is silenced by the blood applied to the testimony of grace when grace is shared. If you're still trying to impress God with anything you do or you don't do, the enemy will beat you every time. It's when you come to the place where you say, the word of my testimony is simply, I'm saved by grace, God's amazing grace through faith. 
dying to self. That's a hard part. That's part of growing in Christ. Many Christians aren't blessed because they constantly monitor their own spiritual condition. Am I spiritually fit enough for God to bless me? Is my spiritual temperature high enough for God to use me on a job or with my family or with my kids? Yet Jesus taught us to deny ourselves, which is why Paul didn't judge even himself. Here's the key. For your, forget yourself and let God bless you for no reason. Let him use you regardless of what you think of how you feel. Uh, in doing so, you'll overcome the enemy. Isaiah 7. We see this all come together. Ask a sign from God, said Isaiah to the wicked king Ahaz. By the way, if you find scripture boring, this is a great chapter to read. It's action-packed. King Ahaz says, no, I will not ask a sign from the Lord. I don't want to tempt God. That was his answer. And although Ahaz's response sounds pious, the real reason behind his refusal was that he was looking to Assyria for help. God had offered him a sign. God had wanted him to come and ask him, but Ahaz publicly rejects it. The sin is therefore now not merely against men, but openly against God. It's not our asking that worries God. It's our refusal to ask, even worse, for God. That's why the original language, Jesus' words in Matthew 7, it's present progressive to keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking and you shall find Keep on knocking, and it shall be opened unto you. Perhaps you're saying, I'm not going to ask God for that job or for that healing in my marriage or for that miracle. And it sounds pious, so selfless, but in reality, it's the result of listening to the accuser of the brother and saying, you're a failure. God can't work in your life until you study harder, or you pray longer, or you read the Bible more, or do better. By the way, the sign Ahaz got, I, I like that if you read it in there, God says, well, I'm going to give you a sign anyway, Ahaz, even when he said, I don't want one. The sign he gave Ahaz in uh, Isaiah 7, 14 is, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. God gave Ahaz the greatest sign of all in spite of the fact that Ahaz refused to even ask. Truly, God draws grace from a bottomless well. Come boldly to the throne. My favorite book, the book of Hebrews says, for there you'll find grace in times of help. When? Every time you have need. We're overcomers. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Dear children, you belong to God if you've given your heart and your life to him. So you've won the victory because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Those are the kind of people I want to be. Those are the kind of people we want to be. Let's pray.